Okay, welcome everyone to the Marisus Metaphors. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I have the honor to introduce Elizabeth David, Academy Professor, Associate Professor Emerita in Spanish and Portuguese at Ohio State University. It is very personal for me that Elizabeth is here. I start thinking about the ocean as a cultural a literary space because of one of her articles. <laughs> so it's um, it's an honor that you are here in Humanities Metaphora, and I thank you very much for your travel and all your travel to get here to California. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm, I brought you something, to, but only to pass around and Warm it with, with your hands and whatever blessings you want. No curses, please. Um, <laughs> as you can see, es un zapatito que compré creo que en Phoenix and in a little shop that was UNICEF or algo así. And somebody with great care had placed these little milagritos all over it. You can see. There's a few that are maritime. Most of them have to do, actually, I'm sorry, a few that are health issues, right? Which is fairly common for the ex-votos, the milagritos. But some, a lot of them have to do with farm animals. So I don't really understand that part, but I could come up with a reason for that, too. So <laughs> just passing it around so you can see what they look like up close, OK? Yeah. Remind me at the end, <laughs> please. <laughs> OK. So um, I, the first thing I want to do really is, is thank Jimena Rodriguez, Professor Rodriguez, for inviting me to this series, which has been on my mind for a long, long time. Ever since she first told me that she was going to be setting up this project, I thought, wow, this is really exciting. Um, there's, a, there, there's a cluster of scholars who are working on the sea now. And hello. Um, and so you know, there, I'm not going to say there are a, a lot of us, but, there, but, the, but those of us who are, are working on similar topics, we pretty much know who, who we are. And we tend to appreciate each other and, and support each other in a distance. So for example, yesterday was the first time that I actually materially met Dr. <laughs> Rodriguez. Unbelievable, because esto lo voy a decir en español, que cuando yo estoy con ella y cuando ella está conmigo, es como, nos, hemos, nos lo hemos dicho, que yo le digo yo, Yo te conozco desde antes de nacer. Yo te conozco desde antes de nacer. Y como que este, el tema de los exvotos también es mío desde antes de nacer, yo creo, ¿no? Entonces, ese tema, ese artículo, ella vibró tanto con ese tema que, bueno, ahí empezó todo, digamos, ¿no? Thank you so much, Jimena, for making this possible and for getting me out to LA, <laughs> where I normally don't, where I don't, where I don't. I, I've been here a few times, but I don't know what that is, so. Okay, guys. So, um, let me say just a couple things at the beginning, okay, without reading anything. First of all, I'm going to ask you just a couple of questions you do not have to answer, OK? Mm -hmm. You don't have to answer these questions. Is it OK if I walk around with this thing on? Can I? OK. Um, so I wanted to just have you think. Hello. I wanted to just have you think about these questions. One, have you or someone that is close to you ever passed through what we or has ever lived through in what we would call in Spanish, una situación límite. So a situation in which you didn't know necessarily whether you were going to get out of it and live to tell the story. Like I said, you don't have to answer. Just think about it. Second, what, 
What are the emotions that come up for somebody who survives such an experience? I think this is really important to try to get into some of this literature, which, you know, but, but, but think about it. I mean, the human, there's a human story behind the words on the page. And that's what I'm interested in getting at. Um, so what, what, what do you imagine that the emotions of, the, of that survivor might be like? Third, someone who has such a tragedy, or an almost tragedy, rather, um, when they make it out alive, what's the first impulse? What do you think it might be? Would they feel just relief, and now it's time to get on about the business of the day? Or would, they, or would it be a tremendous shock to the system, such that they might want to mark, you know, leave a trace of the experience? Mark some of the emotions and, you know, maybe memorialize them in some way. And the last, the last question is, uh, I, I think I said it was going to be two, it's now four. <laughs> <laughs> but they're built on one another, another so. So the last one is, is there an object, a particular special object that, that you might associate with those emotions or that experience, or that you can imagine somebody might you know, associate with the, the, that first impulse after having survived this experience, right? So th just think about those things while I talk. And if you want to say something after, uh, we'll, we, have, we should have time to do that if I really move fast. Please note that these rosaries were removed <coughs> by, I guess, INS, uh, I think it's called, um, at the time when the separation of families was occurring, 2017-18, at the U.S.-Mexican border. And when I first saw this image, I, I was extremely moved and also just kind of crushed because each one of these little rosarios was taken away from somebody at the border, you know. At the, at the, it's not as bad as losing your child, right? But, which was happening too. I had also mentioned in my introductory comments the importance of associating these experiences and, and feelings with an object. And I just kind of wanted to draw your attention to this because it seems to be a real thing right now, the idea of movement of objects. This is, this is a book that just came out not, not long ago at all by Ana Lu Lucia Araujo, and it's called The Gift, How Objects of Prestige, you can't probably see it from the back, but How Objects of Prestige Shaped the, uh, the Atlantic Slave Trade and colonialism. And it's apparently, it's a boom. I mean, it's, it's, it's made a big, you know, uh, impact. And so this is, this is the kind of thing that we're starting to see now uh, on the, you know, in the, in the publication market. It's something that you might just want to think about in terms of your own, your own writing, your papers, whatever. Um, this is a conference that happened just this last weekend, so yesterday and the day before, whatever. Uh, translations, transgressions, and transformations, the global movement of objects in Catholic cultures. And you can probably, in addition to the rosaries that we just saw, you can probably think of other, other objects that might circulate in, in, a, in, in, in a particular universe, right? In a particular world, in a particular moment. I just kind of wanted to make, make you aware of those things. Now, let me introduce you to La Virgen del Buen Aire. She is, was sculpted in 1606, as you can see, and she lives, she lives 
en el Palacio de San Telmo en Seville, en Sevilla. Mm -hmm. uh, so, as I indicate to you here, that building was built in 1682. She already existed, as you can see. She pre-exists the Palacio de San Telmo. She was in Triana, which is where most of the officers and marineros lived. You, you already know, I assume, but let me just refresh your memory, that the ships from the Carrera de Indias, mm -hmm. the Indies fleets, had to arrive back to San Lucar de Barrameda, which is in the Bay of Cadiz, and then make it, you know, cross the bar at San Lucar de Barrameda, cosa que no es fácil. Mm -hmm. La barra de San Lucar se las trae. And then, they, in the Guadalquivir, ya en el Rio, mm -hmm. then they, they go up the river to Sevilla, and then they unload all their treasure, all their stuff, all their, you know, all the um, things that were smuggled, too. I mean, just all, all kinds of things. Um, so yeah, but anyhow, the, so the Palacio de San Telmo is today the seat of the presidency of the Junta de Andalucía, so it's now you know, it's a secularized building. But you should know, it's very hard to get into it. I still have not been able to do it. I've tried. Mm -hmm. But La Virgen del Buen Aire is there. They ha she has her own chapel. They do have tours. It's almost impossible to get, you know, on the, on the you know, inscribirte. But if you're really determined, you can do it. And there she is. There she is. And why, why am I bringing her up anyway? Because of this. You see what she's carrying in one arm, obviously, El Niño Jesús. In the other hand, she has a beautiful, I mean, really very sophisticated silver ship that is, I mean, normally in terms of ex votos, I would associate, associate that with l later production, even later than 1606 when she, was, when she was sculpted, right? Because people didn't have the money to, if they wanted to do an ex voto because of an actual shipwreck, including, we're talking about things like fishing boats. Today, along the coast of Galicia, along the coast of Andalusia, and along co fishing coast, you know, fishing communities everywhere, Portugal, La Costa de la Muerte in Galicia. Esto, esto, uh, and along the, you know, La Costa Cantabrica, but also in places like, I've seen one of these, these beautiful ships hanging in a church in Copenhagen. I mean, who would have thought? They're everywhere. So anywhere, in other words, everywhere where there are people of the sea, it's normal to come across this kind of thing. So this explains where, why on the shoe that should be going around somewhere, I don't know where it is, but on the little foot, esto, you, you don't see a lot of maritime motifs on there. What you see are mostly health problems, right? But this is the thing that interests me because, because what interests me is the sea. So let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about this. Here's another example. This is not an ex voto, strictly speaking, just like the other one was not an ex voto, strictly speaking. This is the Virgen de la Consolación in Utrera. And, and then this, the, 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 the blown up detail is actually this little ship that's in her other hand again. Este, so, just so you can, look at that ship. Can you imagine the money that goes into something like this? I mean, just the idea that you could, I mean, just the labor alone is, is to say nothing of the gold, which there's a good chance it came from America, right? In the broad, I mean, in the big sense, of course. So I wanted to show you those just so you could get a flavor, you know, of, of what's going on. Okay, it was the year 1523, 
in a small house not far from the viceregal palace, a young soldier scribbled words in Spanish on a piece of paper. Earlier in the day, he had strolled down Via de Toledo with the poet, Tancillo, taking in the noises and smells of the city streets and the harbor. Across the bay, Vesuvius stood watch. The conversation of, two, of the two gentlemen has had touched on the news of the day, the ongoing Turkish threat throughout the Mediterranean, recent events at the court, and so on. Eventually, the conversation turned to current debates about poetry and, and poetics in the nearby academia, debates about such things, uh, about the place of poetry in the humanist curriculum, if you can imagine this. <laughs> they actually did talk about these things quite a lot. <laughs> and about what was the best way to imitate the great writers of the past. Now, back in his lodging in the Quartieri Spagnoli, the, so the soldier adjusted the rhyme of a tear set. From Naples, it was difficult for him to grasp the full scope of his native country's global investment and expansion. He had joined important battles in the Mediterranean. So he was a poet and a soldier, right? He had joined important battles there and he had heard about, he had heard about a letter uh, recounting astonishing events that were taking place in, a, in, in some place they were calling New Spain. But he had no firsthand experience with um, the first, with the, the, the growing commerce uh, across the Mar Oceano, which is how they referred to the Atlantic at the time. He had, however, written Italian tile, style sonnets of shipwreck and supplication and deliverance, sonnets that encapsulated in miniature the experience of risky transactions on the water. His name was Garcilaso de la Vega and his verses dazzled the courtiers at the surround, at, that surrounded Charles V back in Toledo. Mm, sorry, his military service and his poems can be understood as his side of a, of a kind of quid pro quo designed to gain him <laughs> protection and prizes at the court. In short, they constitute a kind of ex voto an offering made in order to fulfill a promise of service and exemplary courtesy. Now, let me get back to Garcilas. In the verses of, of, of this poet, and in early modern Spanish poetry generally, there is a, there's plenty of evidence of the enthusiasm Spain's poets had for the sea, even if their navigations were no more than imagined. In this context, and chief among its themes, the poetic critiques of navigation doubtless play the most important role. So it's very interesting that people, uh, on the one hand, condemn seafaring, and, and on the other hand, depend on it to, to some extent for their livelihood, right? Um, Following the lines of classical models that reject the seafaring enterprise, moralizing in the Spanish texts frequently takes the form of denunciations of sailing. And I want to I emphasize this moralizing aspect because in any kind of, ex, well, there's a couple things to, bear, to remember about ex votos in general, votive offerings in general. First of all, that they're all, there's, there's always a transaction. It implies a transaction. Right? And I'm going to talk about that in just a sec. But the other thing is um, that in the, in, the Latin, in the Roman poets already, there was a kind of moralizing going on in the sense that you're expect, the reader is expected to get a truth out of this poem. We're, ex we're supposed to learn a lesson via the lesson learned by this poor, suffer, suffering person who escaped 
tragedy, just barely, right? So, so keep those two things in mind as we, as we, as we mo move along. Um, because of an ancient link between navigation and mercantile economies, the critique of ambition and greed is a corollary of such warnings in the poetic text. Frequently, however, the object of censure is something else. Because the shipwreck metaphor is polyvalent and fluid in early modern Spanish lyric, I think that's another thing to, to think about, about how polyvalent the metaphor is. Poets use it to denounce the risks of love, the instabilities of life at court, and the pleasures of temporal life generally. So it shows up in religious poetry too in some way. One variant of the metaphor is the ancient topic of the ex voto, modulated in such a way that the poem itself becomes a kind of self-serving votive offering on the part of the poet, right? The nautical motif of the ex voto is a lyric genre that evokes the perils of sea travel, um, even among poets who never crossed the Atlantic. Um, neither did they, these people, uh, belong necessarily to, I mean, the poets, right? The people who write about this. They don't really belong to the, the huge mass of people who became sailors on the ships, who were part of the crew. Or in some cases, the cases that interest me the most right now, they ended up being passengers on the ships, uh, which if they could read and write, mm -hmm. could leave a, a valuable testimony, a valuable record for, for us, for people like me, eggheads like me. <laughs> More on this later. But um, uh, so, so, but the poets, for the poets, let's, let's bear in mind that their writing of the sea remained insistently codified in terms inherited from the classics, right? From, from Greco-Roman models. The, but at the same time, all these other people were confronted, confronting the anxieties and the travail of all the difficulties on the water, on the salt water. Um, their, their writings did not incorporate the new, the neologisms, all the new terminology that came in about how to sail, for example. That's not, that's not what they were, they were not all about that. They just wanted to tell the story of the ship, the, the shipwrecked survivor, basically, and, and, get, and have some moral, moralizing lesson. Their manner of imagining the sea and expressing it in poetic imagery corresponds, therefore, to a pre-existing cultural foundation. It's fundamentally conservative, in my view, and nostalgic. In material, um, in material culture, the, no, this is where it gets really interesting. And you've already seen some examples. In the material culture of ex votos, um, the, the object has traditionally mar uh, marked deliverance from peril, but over the centuries, its usage has been significantly broader than this. For example, in Western poetry, there, um, there are many instances of offerings made in recognition of a special bond or commitment between two parties. In these pages, I will be tracing the evolution of the maritime variant of the motif in the lyric of early modern Iberia, well, especially Spain and, and Spanish America, stretching from the Petrarchist sonnets of the 16th century to the religious poems of remorse in the 17th. I here argue that the texts themselves, el libro en sí, no? It constitutes an offering in the broad sense. In other words, an ex voto sensu lato. Garcilaso de la Vega, let's, uh, well, let's, well, I'll just talk to you for, about him for a second. Garcilaso is one of the 
closest followers of Petrarch. Mm -hmm. So that's why he's, he's a big deal. So that's why I wanted to kind of start off with a very canonical poet so that you would, you know, in case maybe you've heard of him in a class, I don't know. <laughs> it, stands to reason, um, it stands to reason that his preferred image, because he's a Petrarchist, he's a Petrarchist poet, um, his, his preferred image for love's vicissitudes um, w it would be an uneven, rocky road winding through a landscape that's diametrically opposed to, the, to what we think of as the locus amoenus, the pleasant garden or whatever. Rock faces of jagged mountains full of precipices, etc. But at the same time, Garcilaso's brief corpus, and I say brief partly because he died so young. He was killed at, in a battle in the Mediterranean at around the age of 34, something like that. I mean, he died very young. A couple of the poets that are in this paper died extremely young. I hope it's not something contagious about the ex votos. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, he does incorporate uh, these sonnets in which shipwreck is the central, in the central, the central metaphor for the for the ordeals of love. Um, so here we go. Okay, so I wanted to show you what I've been talking about: the material cultural, uh, the material culture of ex votos. These are Roman. Roman ex votos at Italica, which is not far at all from Sev Sevilla. So if you go to Seville and you're there for a little while, sin duda, you're going to go one day to have an excursion a Italica, where they have, you know, uh, they have a Colosseum, a Roman Colosseum. They have all kinds of ruinas. They, ca they have still, they have still some pretty well preserved mosaic, Roman mosaic floors. There's still a few there, sculptures, etc., etc. These are embedded into the ground, and you can easily identify what they are, right? So, little feet. So, <laughs> so I, I call this one, got here safely, ciao, mom. <laughs> you know, because it's hard to know whether the person's coming or going, it, but, and I have this. This one's just simply an amplification of the, mm -hmm. of the of the image. Isn't that cool? I mean, just to think how old <coughs> these things are. And this one, I think, I think this one is still exposed. But they did make a very good replica of it. Either or either that or this is the replica, and they put the real one inside the Museo Arqueológico in Sevilla, which is where these. The, that, that collection. These are also at the Museo Arqueológico in Sevilla. Tell me what body parts you think you see there. Or what do you, what do you see? Because they're not all body parts, right? I mean, what, what do you think this is all about? There's one leg. <laughs> we see a leg. That's, that's a milagrito en grande, right? <laughs> it's un milagrón. <laughs> Anything else that you see that looks kind of... I mean, how would you describe these these ex votos? I mean, you've got two at least that are entire bodies. Mm -hmm. So who who knows? Maybe the person just has a complete uh, you know, is, is unable to get up and walk, or just as you know has a very very grave illness. But I'm I'm just going to let you use your imagination with some of the other ones? I mean, I think I know what one of them is, but I'm not going to say it here. I don't know. I mean, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> this is a, a church in Naples, but this is modern. So you can see most of these ex votos, that's my daughter, by the way. Ahí está, tu Elianita. Esto, this, is, this is a church called... Um, Chiesa del Gesù Nuovo in Napoli. And the whole place is just plastered with these ex votos, which are big enough, not like the one I showed you, but big enough to take up, I mean, look, huh? this is each one, or like this is two. 
So most of them were body parts, but not necessarily. And apparently there was a man associated with this church. I don't think he was uh, beatificado or anything like that, but he was somehow, he was a spiritual leader or something like that. And the same thing we see showing up at a place that's going to be very important to us for this talk, which is the Santuario da Virge da Barca in Muxia in Galicia, northeast Atlantic coast of Iberia, okay? So this is one from 1845 where this person has been cured of a terrible illness. So you can see that, you, so you can see that ex votos can be for a range of different reasons, but look at, the, this is very recent. I, f I came across these, now, now we're back to Andalusia. We're going to the south now. So here you go, it's in, this is the Virgen de Regla in Chipiona. Uh, so this one is strictly maritime, as you can see. It is, it's made of silver, so that already tells you something about the people that could afford to hang one of these things. I mean, you know, not, not just any family <laughs> can run out and order one of these, you know? They, they had to be, ordered. I mean, they had to be made sort of on demand. Either that or you made your own, uh, just carving it out of wood. But that's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a whole, there's a whole history to the way these things evolve. So this is hanging in the church of the Virgen de Regla in, in Chipiona, which is right on the coast near the Bahia de, the Bahia de Cadiz. And this one over here is from Jerez, where all the good sherry comes from, you know. Interesting, uh, interesting that they would have. I mean, it's just interesting to me to see what kind of things people put, what kind of things people hang, you know. Ooh, trying to imagine what, what the ailments were. But you, you, can, you can think about that. This, this, this talk will be available online at some point. Um, okay, this one, this is an ex voto, another one from Italica, but it's not exposed to the elements out at Italica anymore. It was taken to the private palace of the Condesa de Lebrija. The, her, her, her palace is full, <laughs> full, full <laughs> of, of objects that were removed from, Ita of, from Italica. This is a whole floor, which is a, an original Roman mosaic floor. I mean, just look at that. It's, it's astoundingly beautiful. I had some questions about el patrimonio nacional and whether or not it was a great idea to let people, you know, aristocrats just kind of get this stuff and take it to their palace. But uh, I, I made that comment to a, a dear friend of mine in Seville, and he said, Bueno, Elizabeth, pero no te olvides que por aquí pasó una guerra. So, you know, he, was, he took a more nuanced view, saying that at least these objects were protected during the Civil War, right? Okay, let's go back up to the Santuario de la Virgen de la, de la, Virgen de la Barca, we would say in Spanish. And... Um, this, okay, I, I, I got to say this. this. This was, for a long time, people talked about this place as, if you wanted to see ex votos, this is the place to go. Maritime ex votos. This was the place to go. 18th century, it's made of solid rock like everything else in Galicia, or, you know, the, built the old, the, according to the old-fashioned way. The sea is right about where I am right now. In other words, it's that far. It's, it's only that far a distance from the water, right? And, and there are all these uh, heavily washed uh, piedras enormes, boulders and kinds of things just lying all around. What I want you to know is that a fire this was in 2013, so it's very recent. It's after I was there, obviously, because I took all these photographs. 
gutted the church. So everything you're going to see on the inside of the church doesn't exist anymore. So, so that I think I want to use that to just make the observation that there's something about the material cultural culture of ex votos that's also ephemeral. I mean, it just is. Things don't last forever. You're going to see what I mean in a minute, but here we go. So this is inside the santuario the way I saw it back in 2000. I don't even remember. Uh, so now I can't tell you anything. Like some of the speakers who come to talk in this series can talk, can talk for 15 minutes about one slide. I cannot tell you anything about this <laughs> ship because other than to say it looks very modern to me. This is a new this is a fairly new ex voto, although it seems to be suspended from maybe something that was already there. Yeah? I would imagine that if you, or the owner of the ship, let's say, or the family or whatever, the family of those who died in a shipwreck, if they wanted to hang a ship, or a replica of a ship, or a part of a ship, they would probably have to pay for the whole shebang. They would have to pay for the the way it's suspended, the et cetera, et cetera. You'll see what I mean. This one to me looks more like a fishing vessel. Just a, I mean, you can even see some nets and things like that. Again, modern, right? So, but, but look, how, look how ornate this is. First of all, you would have to make sure that there's an angel <laughs> right? And all this costs money, of course. An angel who already, you know, is holding a chain on which the ship is suspended. And then, I, I'm not sure if it's connected to anything else below it or not, but you get the idea. You have to have a lot of money to do these things. This is the church when you first enter it. So again, before the fire, how many ex votos do you see hanging there? Can you can you take a, take, can you how many can you spot easily from your seat? <laughs> Maybe five, and then and then, I mean, isn't that amazing? Just to imagine that this is all gone now. They, I mean, they're rebuilding, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's just going to be some modern thing. Another one? This one is a submarine. <laughs> I don't know. This, this one I love. This is somebody's painting. So we've seen replicas of ships, parts of ships, paintings of actual shipwrecks. So this one, you can see, it looks like it's the, maybe the wife and the son of this man who's, who's struggling to survive in the water. And this is the Virgen de la Barca, right on top of, right pretty much on top of the hole. Isn't that just beautiful? But again, this is very modern. So you give something, you get, you give up something, you get something. This one, I thought, might interest Professor Rodriguez quite a lot. <laughs> this is another one. It's called a, um, the, it's like a plaque, sort of like a, they call it a, a tabla, right? Mm -hmm. So, gracias, Virgen de la Barca. It, it's in, all in Spanish. Por el milagro concedido, Ruben Miñones Vilela. Looks like it could be a gallego. Immigrant to Buenos Aires, Argentina. You see? So, but this is, again, this is very recent, 1980. The day that we were in Mushia, I just have to show this. By the way, Mushia is the last place to go. If you, if you ever do the Camino de Santiago, mm -hmm. how many of you would have interest in walking the Camino? Which goes, you know, the pilgrimage. I mean, I'm down if anybody wants to take an old lady <laughs> along with you. Um, <laughs> I'm looking for a partner to do the Camino with. All right, so, 
So, yeah, it just happened to be the day of La Virgen del Carmen when we were there. I, did, I totally forgot about it. My daughter and I walked out of the church, and there was all this commotion going on, boats coming from just across the way. Um, so very colorful, all kinds of dancing. and I just, I had to show you those. Okay, back to the ex-votos. Haciendo un viaje por mar, me vi en peligro de muerte. Invoqué a la Santísima Virgen de la Barca prometiendo dar testimonio de su protección soberana. Cumplo mi promesa. Um, put it right on the wall. Got it? That's the ex-voto. This is the oldest one, to my knowledge, this is the oldest one that they have at the Museo Naval in Madrid. And you can see it's very beat up. This is probably from polychrome in the past. It probably had, you know, it had some, but I mean, again, this is a very rustic one in comparison to all the silver and gold that we've been seeing. All right, now we're back to Garcilaso. So let's just look, what, I'm gonna take you to the next. The, okay, here is a sonnet from six, this a publication in 1605. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm partly watching the clock, and partly I just wanted to choose the one of these that I, I think is probably the easiest to understand. I could have one of you read it. You wanna do me a favor? Oh, sure. Yeah, <laughs> dale. Okay. Stand up, yeah. otherwise I cannot sit up. Oh. Jamás el cielo vio llegar piloto al deseado puerto tan contento. De las furiosas olas y del viento, la nave sin timón y el árbol roto. Y tomando la tierra tan devoto, correr al templo con piadoso intento. Y en él, por verse puesto en salvamento, colgar las ropas y cumplir el voto. Cual yo escapé del mar del llanto mío, pasada la borrasca de mi pena, y en el puerto surgí del desengaño cuyo templo adorné de mi navío, colgué mis esperanzas y cadena por ser mi bien el fruto de mi daño. So, you can see what I mean, I think. Thank you so much, Patricia. This one, it's fairly easy to follow, even if you're not used to reading a lot of Garcilaso or similar poets. I mean, it's this guy, Juan de Morales, who, who nobody ever has heard of since. I mean. <laughs> This was included in an anthology called Flores de Poetas Ilustres, de Poemas, de Poetas Ilustres, 1605. Uh, and uh, he's from Granada, and that's about all I can tell you about this man. But I, I wanted to put it first because I just think that it's such a good example of following that Horatian story, right? It's Horus, puro y duro. I mean, I'm not going to spend any more time on it than that. Let's go back now to Garcilaso, Garcilaso seventh. Uh, Garcilaso was a tricky poet. He was somebody who would tend to imitate several different Latin and Italian poets at the same time. It's what we call eclectic imitation, which is great, except that none of the literary critics of today I mean, there are people who can do it, obviously, because they've, they're the ones who publish the best editions of Garcilaso. But we don't typically recognize the, the subtext or the, the, the intertext, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I guess the things that I would point out here are that... The uh, I guess the the parts that the parts that I think are the reasons why I chose this poem were because well partly because it's by Garcilaso, so he, it's very early. I mean, he died in in the 1530s, so it's it's still fairly early in the 16th century. So this is that's important right there. Um, no pierda más. Quien ha tanto perdido, bástate amor, lo que ha por mí pasado. Válgame ahora jamás haber probado a defenderme de lo que has querido. Tu templo. So who is that amor that he was talking to? Who do you think that is? 
Let's keep reading. Tu templo y sus paredes he vestido de mis mojadas ropas y adornado, como acontece a quien haya escapado libre de la tormenta en que se vido, se vio. Yo había jurado nunca más meterme a poder mío y a mi consentimiento, not willingly, en otro tal peligro como vano. It's pointless. Más del que viene, what, what is the noun that goes with that del? Más del que viene sería Pel peligro, right? Yeah, I promised I would never, I would never, you know. Mm -hmm. Pero del que viene, no podré valerme. Do you understand that? It's, it's, it's pointless to put up a, you know, to protest. Y en esto no voy contra el juramento. I think this is where it gets really interesting. I'm not breaking my promise here. Porque no es que ni es como los otros, not like any other women I've known in the past, no es como los otros ni en mi mano. What does this ni en mi mano mean? How do you understand it? It's out of my hands. So right away he's setting himself up for, you know, another... <laughs> Another shipwreck. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's, it's precious, you know, because this is what I want to say about this sonnet in a nutshell. The transaction here is totally transparent. He's, he's setting it out for you. In Latin, the words for the, for the, for the transaction, for the ex voto is do ut des. I give that you give to give, give. I give that you give. That's basically all it says, but the un you understand the meaning. So I have a friend in Spain who says, do ut des, pero vas tu primero. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's, and that's the idea with the ex votos, no? One other thing about this contract, it's kind of fake in the sense that whatever is being offered to the God whether it's this little wooden ship or whatever it is, is not worth nearly as much as what's being asked for. Do you understand? So I want you to save my life. I want you to get me out of this alive. And, and all I have to do is build a little chapel or some little hermitage or something like that. Do you understand? So it's very tricky, but, the, but, but what I'm trying to emphasize here is that the contractual part, the, con the contract is underlines, it underlies all of these poems and even the material culture, culture of the ex voto to some extent. Mm -hmm. Think about it. When we were seeing all those boats hanging in, the, in Mushia, I couldn't tell you anything about who hung them. Who, which family was it? Why? Because there's something inherently anonymous. I'm sh look, I'm sure in Mushia, which is a small village, I'm sure everybody knew <laughs> at the time. Like, oh, you know, because so many, there's so many shipwrecks in that area. So I'm sure that people knew in the village, right? But with the passing of that generation, a lot of that knowledge is lost. And so, but there's something about, so in addition to being ephemeral, they can burn up real easily, they're also kind of anonymous. When you walk into the church, you have no idea. It's, you know, so, so I, I think that's, that, that's just another aspect of, of this stuff that I want you to see. This is from Catalunya. It's actually, it, it's held in the collection at the Museo Naval in Madrid. And it's one of the older ones. I just think it's absolutely gorgeous. I was thinking about using this one for my book cover, but we shall see. Okay, you've already seen that one. Now, another motif that comes up in these, in these sonnets, that just the ones you've seen, 
They talk about cadenas a lot. They talk about being free of my chains. Well, I'm just going to explain it quickly like this. Th these are, this is real. This, this, this photograph is from San Juan de los Reyes, <coughs> a church in Toledo, so far from the sea. But people, would, people made a pilgrimage once, when they were freed, either from captivity in Algiers, let's say, mm -hmm. or slavery. And, they, and they, they made it to this church, which is associated with Isabel la Católica. And you can see all of these are, are hanging chains. They're, they're still there, there. You know, when I first saw them, yo gringuita de mí, just, what, what is all this stuff hanging off the church, you know? <laughs> okay, now, this is, now we're jumping, we're jumping. We're making a jump to the, halfway through the 17th century, the, the things are gonna change, right? There's a different, even the ideology changes to some extent. In many cases, in many things, look, look at it again. The first thing you see is rotas cadenas. Got it? We just talked about that. Um, rotas cadenas. And over here you see um, remos graves colgados en el templo y, y, y rotos. So the word <coughs> roto, rota appears twice. So I think this is really curious, no? Quevedo was an amazing poet. That's one thing. But um, it, there's, there's something about this. Look at this, you guys. He says how, how he's so happy when he walks into the church and he sees all these ship, all the boat parts, the, the jarcias y antenas sitting on the altar. They've been offered to the God, right? Or the God, or, or God, yeah. simply. Um, <coughs> And then at the very ending, I wanted to say, look at the, just the last tear set of the sonnet. Premiad con mi escarmiento mis congojas. Usurpe al mar mi nave, muchas naves. Débanme el desengaño los pilotos. So what he's basically saying is, how do we say this in Spanish today? Um, Curate en salud. Follow, you know, see what happened to fulano over there? Don't let that happen to you. Curate en salud, right? So he's basically saying, look, just use my case as an example. As an example not to follow, right? So, so that, again, that's the moralizing aspect of the sonnet. This I'm only including so that you can see how far this tradition extends up to the present. This is a 19th century Cuban sonnet written by um, Jose Maria de Heredia. And uh, it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, it's, it's completely different. I mean, Heredia is a romantic poet, and he's dedicating this sonnet to his wife. Not in a moment of passion, but after the passion has calmed and the relationship is tri tried you know, tested. And he, there's this uh, incredible peace um, in this poem, which at the same time talks about, talking about eh, la fiera juventud que ardía en mis venas férvidas. I mean, that's how it starts out, but it ends on, on a much calmer note. Interestingly enough, Heredia in the 19th century is the other poet who dies very, very young, you know? It's, it's tragic. This, I think, is gorgeous. Just kind of ripped it off the internet. Um, but this is, I think this, is, this one is French, and it's a painting. There, it's the whole family. It looks like a fishing, maybe a fishing family, ready to take their ex voto into the church to be dedicated and suspended, probably. Isn't that gorgeous? I just had to sh show you that one. I, I told you that I would talk about the fourth genre, which, let's, let's just speak plain, plain English. I'm talking about nonfiction. 
What I want to jump to is from this very lit literary tradition of poetry, etc., and to show you how in travel, travel, let's see, relaciones, accounts, travel accounts of the same period, all the codes of the ex voto tradition have already been completely absorbed and assimilated by the writers. Many of whom, as I said before, it mattered if you were if you were a passenger on these ships. It mattered if you could read or write. Most of these people were priests, so it may not it may not surprise you that they would think of the ex voto in a Christianized kind of way. And I'll show you a couple of examples of this. This is for any graduate students who might be here. And I can leave this in the, the version that's going to be shown online. Este, because, it, because really what I'm, what I'm considering here is the relación de viajes, or de sucesos, or de méritos y, what was it? Méritos y servicios. Este, and, you know, as a, I'm looking at it as a, as a fragment of life writing. Yeah, of life narrative. And, and so I wanted to, some of my questions are, what is the purpose of, of writing a travel account of this kind? What do these writers want? I, I gave out one of the texts that I'm writing about, this is from my book, in my graduate class, the last graduate class I ever taught at Ohio State. And, and one of my students, a brilliant young woman, said, I want to know, ¿qué es lo que quiere? ¿Qué quiere el escritor? What's he, what is, you know? I mean, obviously, you wrote these relaciones to get something, right? Um, and <coughs> she was really, she wanted to know, specifically, is he looking for a, a, a prize, like a position at court? Does he want, you know, a latifundio en el Perú or something? I, what does he want? <laughs> um, so how do we theorize, not just autobiography, but more, that's been worked on quite a bit. And I'm suggesting that this is a good place to start. This particular book um, by, by Smith and Watson, reading autobiography, make sure if you get it that you get the second edition, because they made a lot of changes. Uh, but I also recommend an article by, by Dorit Cohen in which she points out something that I think is really important too, which is that if you're talking about nonfiction, we, we tend to have different expectations from the text, right? I mean, think about it. If you say, well, I'm going to tell you about a car accident that I was in. What do you, I mean, what's your first... What's the first thing you, you think? You, you're not going to think, oh, this person is just making up a bunch of stuff. You're going to think, oh, my God, this really happened to this person. This is truth, right? This is, this is, there's a reference to the real world beyond the story. And I think that's really important. That Co so Dorit Cohen writes about how this referential level of the text in nonfiction makes a huge difference in the way we read it from, let's say, reading a novel, right? Um, so that's one thing. And then finally, D Daniel Lehman's book, Matters of Fact, reading nonfiction over the edge. The title kind of says it all. He talks about how, how the story that's told in a nonfictional text kind of slides off the edge of the page into the real world. I, I just love that that image, you know, for trying because nonfiction hasn't been theorized nearly as much as novels. Let's say there's a lot of of, and even for autobiography, there's a lot of theory, but for nonfiction, partly because it's historical truth, it's hard. You know, it's it's it's. So I I, I thought it might help some student who's thinking about these issues. So 
what are the truth expectations of each kind of text? How do they differ and why does it matter to us? So I'm not going to have time to read all this, but that's OK. Um, I, think I, I think you've probably understood. The, the, the only point that I w wanted to make here, really, is that one of my priests, these, the guys who were in a shipwreck, in fact, this guy was in three. In the same journey, the same fleet had three shipwrecks. And the last one happened at San Lucar de Barrameda. So they made it through two years of, of circulating around the Caribbean because of hurricanes and other disasters, rats in Havana, etc. And finally, they make it across the Atlantic. They decide to spend the night. This is true. They decide to spend the night in the Bay of Cadiz and cross the bar to go up to Seville the next morning. Guess what? They wake up in the morning. What do you think they see? Want to take a guess? English pirates all around the fleet. I mean, you know, burnt ships, deaths, you, you, you didn't want to know. But I mean, this is so, so amazing. So this guy, who's a priest, um, knows the tradition so well that he says to the person he dedicates the story to, who's his patron at the court in Madrid, si después de un naufragio ofrece el navegante en el templo la tabla mm -hmm. uh, en, que, en que escapó del peligro, meaning the actual plank that he held on to for dear life in this case, ya? Yeah? Para el confesar la obligación sirva de recompensa al beneficio, ya que con Dios no puede tener otro desahogo la gratitud por estar tan ajeno de toda necesidad. No es menos decente el confesarse agradecidos a las deidades humanas, que son los ministros. You can see where he's going with this. His patron is at the court, and he's a really, really important aristocrat on the Consejo de Indias and all this kind of thing. So he's saying, how can I do less than all these writers who have offered their, their ofrendas votivas? Here's my text. Here, have it. It's yours. Mm -hmm. Now, as my student would say, what does he want? <laughs> So, so that's one. That's one, and this is the last thing I'm going to talk to you about. And I, I don't really have a lot to say about it because I think it speaks for itself. Look at the title of this work: Tabla de Naufragio. Huh? This is a shipwreck off the coast of Mexico, in Al El Alacran, and it's written by a, you know a writer that most people have not heard of. Uh, a discalced Carmelite. And what he does is, watch this. You ready? Mm -hmm. He draws it. Mm -hmm. Isn't that just <coughs> astounding? Just, I mean, just the drawing itself is so perfect. Mm -hmm. And he sends it, as I understand it, he sends it back to Spain, to Cordoba, to a convent where it will be somehow suspended. So it could be framed or hung on the wall, but you know, that's, I mean, when I saw that in an archive in Spain, I just thought, that's it, you know, this is, this is I feel, I feel called, <laughs> I feel called to tell this story. Okay, guys, this is just out of curiosity's sake. This is the same replica de la, de la Victoria que está en el Guadalquivir. Está en Sevilla en este momento. And I knew, I met her at the, ar at the archive, en el Archivo de Indias. The daughter, the, a, a researcher who was the daughter of the capitán who sailed this replica, mm -hmm. not quite around the world, they, they skipped the Magellan Straits, mm -hmm. probably for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. But they went to Japan, and they, you know, they, they did most of it. Mm -hmm. 
And this is just my goodbye mm -hmm. to all of you. This is looking out over the Bay of Cadiz, well, out towards the Atlantic mm -hmm. from San Lucar de Barrameda. So that's all. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you.